Okay, good evening and welcome. I am going to call the meeting to order. It is now 7.01. Thank you for being here. We're going to open with our flag salute, and I'm going to turn, turn it over to our council mem member, Arnsen, to introduce our guest. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so we've got somebody coming in to do the, this is quite a list of accomplishments, so I'm, I'm really happy to read it. Christian Lim is a senior at Marshall High School and also the 2022-23 school year ASB president. And outside of ASB, Christian also holds positions as Asian club president, soccer club president, boys volleyball club president, key club fundraising commissioner, as well as a sitting member of a number of other clubs. And because he clearly isn't doing enough to keep busy, Christian also plays for the varsity soccer and volleyball teams. He plans to get his bachelor's degree in business or computer science, and with his incredible drive and commitment, I have no doubt he'll achieve his goal of becoming an entrepreneur after college. And with his clearly packed schedule, I, I would love you to help me thank Christian for taking the time to be here with us tonight. Thank you, Christian. Please rise and face the flag for the Pledge of Allegiance. Place your right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Okay, um, we're gonna do our roll call. Council Member Wong. Chair. Victoria Knapp. Present. Amy Leifert. Excuse us. Billy Malone. Present. Nick Arnson. Present. Dorothy Wong is here. Hannah Petrie. Excused. Thank you. Dr. Sandra Thomas. Excused. Thank you. Chris O'Malley. Here. Veronica Jones. Here. Uh, Daryl Aranda. Thank you. Madeline Barber is in our minds and hearts forever. Uh, Alan J. Peck. Here. Uh, Reginald Wilkins. Here. Doug Cauliflower. Here. Sylvia Vega. Here. Thank you. Diane Markison. Excuse me. Thank you. Uh, we have a quorum, I think three. Four. Excuse, four excuse. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next on the agenda, we're going to approve our meeting agenda for tonight. Council Member Knapp. Good evening, community and fellow council members. Before I approve the agenda, I just wanted to let everyone from the community know that if you, we will get to general public comment a little further down the agenda. If you have a public comment, anything related to the agenda or not, there are public comment cards on the piano in the back. Please complete one of those and you can hand them to anybody at the end of the, um, at the tables here and then we will get to your public comment. If you leave your contact information, then your council member will know how to get back to you as we don't respond to public comment during these meetings. Uh, the Altadena Town Council Executive Committee met on Tuesday, August 9th to set the agenda for tonight's meeting. The agenda was circulated to you fellow council members on Friday evening, August 12th. I have one change. Um, in the interest of time, the chair and I will be yielding our time and not providing reports tonight. Are there any other changes? I have one correction. Uh, uh, listed as Christian Lamb, it's Christian Lim, L-I-M. Okay, and I also noticed that it will be Doug Cauliflower delivering the chamber report. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, okay. So we've got Doug on the chamber, and it's Christian. Okay, thank you so much. So noting those changes, I motion the agenda be approved as amended. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstaining? Abstaining? No. So the motion carries and the um, agenda is, a, is amended as approved. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna move on and so we're skipping chair and vice chairman's report and we're mo moving directly to the recording secretary 
Nick Arnzen. The July 19th, 2022 minutes were distributed to council last week. I received no corrections or changes. Are there any tonight? With no changes, I move that we accept the July 19th, 2022 minutes as received. Second. Motion has set second and are the, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? Any abstaining? One abstaining. Thank you. Okay, so um, the minutes are approved as presented. Thank you. We move on to our treasurer's report because we have a whole lot of money. Go ahead, Chris. A whole lot of money. <laughs> a whole lot of money. I do, uh, you know, if anybody wants to donate, we've got a can going around. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I wanted to make sure we mentioned, I apologize. We're um, sending a can out. We, uh, we are a, not a nonprofit, but not an official government organization, so we rely on the community's uh, contributions. Thank you, Reggie, for handing the can. Stop trying to be treasurer, Nick. Uh, please, uh, we'll get a QR code somewhere one of these days. Moving to the 21st century. Uh, so for the statement starting June 29, 2022 and ending July 27, 2022, we began with a balance of $1,427.48. We had $309.73 deposits uh, for uh, Madeline Barber's memorial expenses. Uh, of that, um, that all went out. Hold on, give me a second. Sorry, there's a lot here today. Um, we had a check order fee run, refund and a monthly service charge refund totaling 43.73 that went back into our account from last month. That was due entirely to my charm. Uh, we had a uh, 375 check going out to the Madeline Barber Fund. Uh, we refunded Doug Cauliflower $200 for the community center open house, which was a smashing success. Um, name tags, uh, you reimbursed me $50 for Madeline's and Hannah's, and uh, I finally got around to reimbursing myself $158.67 for the election from last year. Uh, and so we ended with a um, ending balance on July 27, 2022 was $924.55. And that is my report, thank you. Thank you, Council Member O'Malley. Now we move on to Corresponding Secretary Dorothy Wong. Thank you, Chair Jones. Uh, so for my Corresponding Secretary report, uh, I just want to remind everybody to submit any event listings you have to dorothy.wong at altadenatowncouncil.org. And I will add that to our community events list. Also check out the Altadena Library, altadenanews.org. Reminder, our monthly farmer's market Wednesdays at Lower Loma Alta Park, 4 to 7 p.m. Use the parking lots at the upper Loma Alta Park and the Loma Alta staging area is encouraged. And we do have three concerts left, concerts in the park, August 20th, August 29th, Saturdays at Farnsworth Park and the finale on September the 10th. And then I just wanted to highlight a special notice. Uh, we did have some uh, increase in bear um, activity, and uh, we did have a bear encounter um, with the temperatures heating up, um, and that took place in the meadows recently. We did have also a, um, a wildlife living with um, wildlife uh, YouTube or a recorded meeting on Zoom, which will be on our town council website. And so there is on a resource page, uh, you can check out uh, Altadena Wildlife, and there are uh, some great links uh, that you can find on Living with Wildlife, a Wildlife Watch program, uh, Keep Me Wild campaign, and different brochures. Um, so thank you very much. We do have a couple of highlight events. Uh, the Devil's Gate Dam Project uh, will be having an open house for the Southeast entrance tomorrow, and then um, uh, Thursday, uh, tomorrow from six to seven, and then Thursday at seven o'clock will be a Zoom meeting uh, to talk about that and learn about some other great events at the Altadena Town Council website. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Council Member Wong. And I just wanna say real quick, I see that Cinch is in the house, so I just wanna thank you guys for showing up. And Granny, I haven't seen you in how many years now? Thank you, thank you. Those are our supporters. So I, I really appreciate them being here. Okay, now here comes the exciting thing for tonight. And it's going to be my favorite part. 
and I get to in introduce an amazing woman. She has supported me from the beginning of my time on the town council. She's a woman that knows what she believes and stands up for what's right. Judy Chu was elected to the U.S. House of Representatives in July 2009. She represents the 27th Congressional District, which includes Pasadena and our very own San Gabriel Valley, which also includes Altadena. This woman believes and has worked to make sure the civil liberties of any group are never violated. She believes protection of ideas of justice and equal protection under the law is necessary to ensure our community is a place where all people are treated equal. And can you believe that this idea is under attack right now in our own very own government? So I appreciate you, Judy. So a few of the Congresswoman's accomplishments in Congress include introducing and passing a congressional resolution of regret for the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882. She worked with President Obama to declare our, our San Gabriel Mountains a national monument. She worked with the Department of Defense to address military hazing. She helped entrepreneurs all over, including in our own San Gabriel Valley, to establish two small business development centers right here in our area. I think one is at PCC. Um, she helped biz small businesses refinance old expensive real estate loans by reviving the Small Business Administration 504 Loan Refinance Program. And very recently, she stood up for women's rights, for my rights. She, led, she was in Washington, D.C., and that led to her being arrested. So I say again, she's a woman who stands up for what she believes and is ready to be arrested for it. Do I need to say more, or is this person someone we can love and support? And we're proud that she's here, and it's my pleasure to introduce Congresswoman Judy Chu. Wow, what a wonderful introduction. And I especially enjoy that it came from my Congressional Woman of the Year for Altadena, Veronica Jones. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I honored her this year at our um, annual event, and I could not have been prouder for the kind of accomplishments that she has made here in Altadena, and she makes all of us proud. So congratulations, Veronica. Uh, and I am so proud to represent Altadena in my congressional district. But guess what? This is my first time being at your town council meeting. So this is quite an occasion. <laughs> um, and it gives me a chance to say what's going on, uh, uh, something about what's going on in um, Washington, D.C. Now, you know there are those who say that uh, Congress is dysfunctional and isn't getting anything done. Well, nothing could be farther from the truth this year. We have made some amazing accomplishments that will really change America for the better. And it couldn't come soon enough because we know that uh, Americans are suffering. We know that prices are rising, especially food prices. It's making it tougher for people to make ends meet. But I tell you, with the legislation that we just passed, I, that relief is definitely on the way. And in fact, it was just last Friday that I was in Washington, D.C. to vote for the historic inflation Reduction Act. And just today, President Biden signed it into law. And I was proud to have a little role in it, too, because I'm a member of the Ways and Means Committee, which has jurisdiction over health and tax legislation. So I was proud to have a seat at the table as Congress wrote and negotiated this bill over the past year. How will it make uh, our prices lower? How will it make costs lower for the American people? Well, for one thing, it will make the cost of prescription drugs lower. 
especially for our seniors by finally allowing Medicare to ne negotiate for the price of prescription drugs. It also guarantees that Medicare beneficiaries, our seniors, do, will not pay more than $2,000 per year on prescription drugs. And no senior on Medicare will pay more than $35 a month on insulin. And it ensures that the subsidies for those on the Affordable Care Act, which will therefore make their health insurance affordable and, and something that, that they can have for a long time, that that will continue on for many more years. What's more, this le legislation represents our nation's largest investment ever in fighting climate change and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. It will improve people's lives by expanding tax credits uh, and commercial and consumable for both com commercial and consumer renewable energy. And consumers will get relief in their pocket because it's going to give tax rebates for installing energy efficient appliances, which of course will make their utility costs lower. And it will extend tax credits for electric and hydrogen powered vehicles. We also provide it more than $60 billion for clean energy manufacturing in the US. Anyway, all of this together will do something very important, reduce carbon emissions by 40% by 2030. And that will give us historic progress towards the goal of dealing with our climate crisis. What's more, it will reduce our deficit and lower inflationary pressures across our entire economy. And by establishing a minimum 15% tax on the largest corporations making over $1 billion in profits, um, we will create a fa fairer tax system. So don't let anybody tell you that this will hurt small business. Actually, this, will, uh, this provision here will affect only 150 of the most profitable firms in the United States. And at least they will pay their fair share instead of doing what some of those corporations do, which is um, pay nothing in taxes. Uh, and it will, um, this bill will provide $80 billion to improve the internal revenue service so that we don't have to wait hours upon hours on the phone to get some kind of service. Um, so this is going to be a major step forward, and we are going to see progress just within the matter of weeks. Um, but this comes on top of something else, because we also passed the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. This historic legislation fixed a problem that we've had in this country for decades, and that is our infrastructure has been allowed to deteriorate to a ridiculous degree. And in fact, for many years, we were given a D grade by the American Society of Civil Engineers. So what this bill does, this infrastructure bill, is invest $1.2 trillion to rebuild our American infrastructure. It bolsters high-speed internet. It expands access to clean drinking water, and it advances environmental justice and invests in communities that are too often left behind. And to top it off, this legislation will create two million new good paying jobs per year over the next 10 years. I was proud to vote for this because I knew that this would benefit Southern California from our public transit systems, to our ports, to our many highways and freight rail lines, um, by making more federal funds available for those projects, we will be able to free up additional state and local funding for critical infrastructure projects in our region, for instance, for completing the gold line, which we all wanna see go all the way out to Claremont and then to the Ontario airport. And already, this law is delivering results for California 
To date, $9.2 billion in infrastructure funding has already been announced for our state, including $8 billion for infrastructure, nearly $300 million to combat extreme weather and climate change effects, and over $600 million for clean, uh, uh, for clean water. And actually, we've already seen some progress, which is that more than 1.6 million households across California are receiving uh, access to affordable internet as a result of this law. And then there's our third major accomplishment, the CHIPS law. Now, I have been amazed to discover how much semiconductor chips affect our lives. And everything from calculators to computers to cars. And the fact that we do not have enough domestically produced chips has resulted in our supply chain problems. This is why so many of us are having trouble getting the products that we need, and as a result, um, so many people are very frustrated, but it also increases inflation in this country. So what we did was to pass a CHIPS law, and what this will do is to give incentives for the manufacturing of semiconductor chips in this country. Did you know that we, in the US, produced at one time nearly 40% of the chips in the world? Today, we're down to 12. Mm. Yeah, 12%. And actually, uh, Asia uh, produces 80% of it. But what this means is we're totally dependent on outside foreign influences as far as our ability to produce all those products. So that's why this, this CHIPS law is so important. So it will create $52 billion worth of semiconductor chips, and also it will ensure that America remains a global leader in science and technology with the nation's um, largest five-year investment in public research uh, ever, and uh, $100 million actually that we're putting into world-class research institutions. And for us, with institutions like Caltech and JPL, this is certainly going to be a huge boost. Now, Altadena is right at the foothills of the San Gabriel Mountains. And I was so very, very proud to um, work with President Obama to have those mountains declared a national monument, which gave it a huge boost of um, of funds, but also of personnel to manage the area. And as a result, the graffiti and trash has been cleaned up. But our job is not yet done. And that's why I have uh, introduced the San Gabriel Mountain, um, Mountains, Foothills, and Rivers Act. And this is a bill to make uh, the surrounding areas that were not covered by the monument uh, a national recreation area. This means that we will have an item in the budget that can only increase to uh, do projects that will improve everything leading up to the mountains. The trails, um, the roads, the, in fact, we, we hope to have a public transit system where um, you could uh, maybe get the transit down at the base of the, of, of the mountains and then go up um, and therefore it would be, make the transportation up there much more efficient. It would expand the National Monument, designate it 30,000 of new and expanded wilderness and make sure uh, that uh, actually not only the mountains but the rivers that are coming out of the mountains get some resources as well. Now I am glad to say to all of you that, that this bill has passed out of the House and so we're awaiting action in the Senate, but uh, we are very, very hopeful because it's gone as far as it ever has gone, and so hopefully this can get done. And th we need to do this because of the, uh, the hazards that are faced if we don't uh, take care of that area. And I'm talking about the danger of wildfire. Uh, I know that, that Altadena was really, um, Frightened by the Bobcat Fire, which burned 115,000 acres of our forest land in 2020, uh, there was 
uh, a very sobering reminder of the risk that uh, of fire that we face in this area. So I am pleased to say that the Congress has taken steps to mitigate these risks and uh, the Infrastructure and Jobs Act that I just talked about provided more than $5 billion for wildfire risk reduction and rehabilitation and a further $5 billion to protect our critical infrastructure from natural disaster. And uh, in the newly passed Inflation Reduction Act, we will see more federal dollars flowing into our district to help combat the uptick in natural disasters due to the climate crisis. And let me talk about something that we did pass on a bipartisan basis. And um, this was something that has not been done in 30 years, and that is a bill to deal with gun violence. This was the bipartisan um, gun safety bill and um, the Bipartisan Safer Communities Act. Uh, after what happened in Uvalde, after what happened at Buffalo, we just had to do something. Of course, there were many of us, like I myself, feel very passionately about this issue, but we didn't have the votes to get it across the finish line. Finally, we got this bill passed, and I think that it will take us a step forward in addressing gun violence, uh, that is the gun violence that's occurring in our society, such as with red flag laws to keep guns out of the hands of people who are a danger to themselves and others. It will close a boyfriend loophole, which allowed boyfriends to be able to retain their guns. Um, uh, and so it does away with that, uh, just as it would with, with husbands or spouses who have guns that are a danger. And it requires young people ages 18 to 21 to undergo enhanced background checks um, and includes the first ever federal law that makes gun trafficking and straw purchases uh, distinct federal crimes. So we hope to just take it from there and keep on going until we can actually make this country safe from the proliferation of gun violence. Finally, let me say something that is very special to Altadena. A wonderful thing happened in Congress, and that is um, last year came the first um, community project funding proposal. And that is they allowed each of us Congress members to be able to gather proposals from our local communities as to projects that needed funding. And then we would submit them to our appropriations committee. If it passed the appropriations committee, then it could be passed into law. And in fact, that's what happened in my last year's proposals. But this year, guess what? Altadena did submit one of those proposals for Charles White Park. Uh-huh. And it sounded so great to me that I decided to submit it to the Appropriations Committee, and it did pass that committee. So it is in the bill now. And what it does is provide $750,000 um, towards park-wide infrastructure improvements, walking paths, a pickleball court, <laughs> yeah. and improvements to lighting and site furnishings, and it will also feature civic art honoring the park's namesake, Charles White, who was a renowned artist who lived in Altadena and received national recognition for chronicling the African American experience. So we, we got past step one, we got it in the appropriations bill, and now we just have to make sure that this appropriations bill makes it the whole way through on the Senate side. Uh, once it does that, certainly President Biden will sign it into law. So, <laughs> so thank you. It's been a very productive year and I invite any and all of you to partake of the services in our office. If you need help with veterans issues, um, with Social Security, with Medicare, 
uh, or with any of these issues, please come to my office, which is in Pasadena. And I just happen to have my staff members here. I just wanted to introduce you to them. Uh, my deputy chief for the district office is here, Enrique Robles. And we have a special guest here. She's actually normally in Washington, D.C., but uh, she is checking us out over here. So that is <laughs> Sonali Desai. But I especially wanted to introduce you to my new staff member who is going to be taking care of Altadena. Uh-huh. And that's Jubilee Byfield. So thank you all very much, and I really appreciated having this talk with you. Thank you. Can we all stand and give her a hand? Yes, thank you. Thank you very much for honoring us today, tonight. It won't be the last time. At, at all, and just like I said, I really um, think you're amazing, and I know that you don't forget us when you're in Washington. I really know, and I know that your staff is very helpful, so please do reach out to them. They helped me with a senior project, uh, problem in my uh, census tract, so thank you very much. That was when Jonathan helped me oh. with that, yes. So thank you, and thank you for being here. Thank you. Thanks. Yes. OK. All right. OK, so we're going to move right along here. Uh, we've been told that we have to get out of here as soon as possible and not to linger. So we're going to um, move on now to our Altadena Road Maintenance Update by Dominique Desma. It's Stephen Gutierrez and Yona Halpern. Oh, I have the wrong one. Yeah. Okay. Oh, Stephen's not here. Okay. Okay. Let's see who it is. Do you have a PowerPoint? Do we need to move? She has it. Yes. Okay, so we need to move. Okay. Hmm? Let me see. Thank you, Madam Chair, Council Members. Wow, I don't know. How are we supposed to follow that, right? <laughs> We do. Um, it's, it's more of an informational type of presentation, so hopefully this could shed some light on, on maybe some lingering questions that's been uh, circulating throughout the uh, community. There it is. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dorothy. Thank you again, Madam Chair, Council Members. Uh, thank you for having us here at the uh, Altadena Town Council meeting to pre present to you. My name is Dominic Osmeña. I'm the uh, Assistant District Engineer for Road Maintenance Division here at County Public Works, uh, District Office 2, which oversees the Altadena area. Um, I, along with my uh, co-worker, Mr. Yona Halpern here from our Geotechnical and Materials Engineering Division. That's a, that's a mouthful, huh? <laughs> I had to say it a few times to kind of get it in my head here. Um, we are here to present to you um, an overview of the county's roadway pavement program and how, the, how projects are compiled and put together, not only just um, in Altadena, but just countywide. So with that, I'll, I'll transfer the expertise over to Mr. Yona Halpern. Yona. Thank you, Dominic. And thank you to the town council for this opportunity to present. Um, it is a hard act to follow, uh, Congressman Chu, but I will say that I believe it's aligned with some of the information that we heard from her. So she talked a little bit about the U.S. climate bill with the goal of reducing carbon, carbon emissions. And that is a strategy that we also employ uh, at Public Works. And we'll talk a little bit about that in more detail here. Uh, and the second thing that she talked about that I believe is relevant to the program is the bipartisan infrastructure law. And so one of the things that we're working on at Public Works is uh, submitting grants for, for, those, for that law. And with that, I'll get right into the presentation. So 
Unincorporated Los Angeles County, we maintain one of the most complex and diverse road networks in the country with over 7,500 lane miles and 580 million square feet of pavement. For reference, that's the equivalent of over 12,000 football fields. The overall pavement condition index in the county is 65. Next slide. And 65 is considered a fair rating. Altadena specifically has 278 lane miles and 22 million square feet. Altadena represents about 4% of the network. And as you can see here, Altadena actually has a higher pavement condition index than the rest of the county at 71. Uh, so here's a screenshot of all the roads in Altadena and the different colors represent the pavement condition index on individual streets. And this is all publicly, in, publicly available information. You can go to this website here or if you Google LA County My Streets, you can pull up this website and you can actually look at the pavement condition index right in front of your house. Okay, what, what, what are our goals as a program? Uh, our our program-wide goal is to treat the right roads at the right time with the right treatments. I said that wrong. The right roads with the right treatments at the right time and in the right way. So we're going to talk a little bit about the right roads and the right treatments and the right time. The right way means we execute our construction properly. And I'm mo mostly going to focus on two main issues here. First, engineering, and second, sustainability. The program has a very robust um, and comprehensive engineering process. And so we really appreciate the opportunity of you to, to come here and present it to you. We wanna be transparent in our process and how we operate. And so thank you again for inviting us and let's get into it more. Okay, you heard me talk about PCI, the Payment Condition Index. So how is that determined? We have two ways that we determine that. First is we have full-time county staff whose sole job is to drive all of the roads of LA County and take pictures of different types of cracks. The second way we do it is we have a consultant that has a specialty vehicle with high resolution cameras. And this vehicle we use to drive around major streets where there's more of a safety concern and up in North County where there's longer segments of road. All of the evaluations are done on all county roads every two to three years. So that website that we showed you before, My Streets, is updated regularly and you can expect that every single road in the county is getting a new evaluation rating every two or three years. Here's a few of the different types of cracks. I won't bore you with too many details here, but we're looking at type, severity, and extent. And so these cracks are characterized based on an ASTM standard, ASTM 6433, and as you can see here, the width of the crack is one of the indicators of severity. There's also different types of cracks, and so our pavement evaluators are experts in identifying cracks, and these are the types of things that they're looking for. Once our evaluators and, and the specialty vehicle go out and take pictures of all the cracks and we come up with the severity and the different types of cracks, it all gets entered into a pavement management system. We have been told that our pavement management system at the county is one of the most powerful in the country, which is fantastic. And so you'll see here that once all of those different types of cracks are entered, uh, the program actually calculates what the payment condition index is for each individual street. And again, you'll see Altadena here, and you can go to the My Streets website to see what the payment condition index is in front of your house. Okay, typical pavement performance curve. I could spend 10 minutes at least just on this, just on this one page, but I will. I will try to be brief and just explain, just pick out a few particular items. The first thing I wanna point out is that there are different treatments that are needed depending on the condition of the road. And so you'll see for reconstruction is for failed roads. When roads have highly deteriorated and there's nothing else you can do to preserve them, you need to fully reconstruct them. Versus preservation, when a street's in good condition to maintain that good condition, we have different treatments. And so I wanna point out the cost difference between reconstruction and preservation. And you'll see that reconstruction can actually be 10 times more than preservation. So the opportunity cost to do one mile of reconstruction would be, can be 10 miles of preservation. So when we talk about doing the right roads with the right treatment, it's really critical that we catch these roads at the right time so that we're not falling into more expensive treatment categories. 
The second thing I want to point out from this slide is you'll see under the rehabilitation and reconstruction treatments, you'll see there's a conventional and sustainable methods. And so the county is very focused on sustainable treatments. And I want to point out that in addition to being environmentally sustainable and more environmentally conscious, these treatments are also more economically sustainable. So we'll talk a little bit about the reasons why that is, but you can see here that the sustainable treatments are actually cheaper than the conventional methods. All right, so we have PCI, we got these numbers. How do we go from PCIs to projects? <laughs> Does someone else want to take a shot at this slide? <laughs> so I'll spare, I'll spare you the details of this slide, but what I do want to point out is that, what, what I do want to mention is that we, we have the PCI for all the individual roads and we've entered all of that into road matrix. So how do we get to projects? Once a year we run that program and that program optimizes for us which roads need to have projects. And so the goal of that program, the way the algorithm is written, is to catch roads before they fall into a further, into a worse condition, thus warranting a more expensive treatment. So we want to catch them at the bottom right before they fall into another category and have to spend more money. This is just one of the decision trees in the program. There's actually a whole suite of them. Um, and we just wanted to show it to you just so you can kind of see what's going on behind the scenes. Once we run the program, we get an, a list of all the individual streets that's prioritized and which street needs which treatment. So once we get to this stage, what we do is we go and we combine individual street segments into community projects. And we do that for a few reasons. The first obvious reason is economies of scale and efficiency. We're gonna do one road all over the county, we're gonna deal with multiple mo mobilizations. It's not a very efficient operation, multiple contracts, et cetera. So we wanna do community projects, that's the first reason. The second reason is we wanna be equitable within your neighborhood and within your community. We don't wanna do your street but not your neighbor's street and get complaints from your neighbor. And similarly, we don't wanna do the street next door and, and have you complain that your neighbor's got a new street but you didn't. So we wanna be equitable within the neighborhood. And the third reason that we combine individual streets into projects is because we want the entire neighborhood to be on the same maintenance schedule. So for future projects, we wanna be able to come in and continue the same process. All right, enough about engineering, let's talk about sustainability. The county has an award-winning sustainable three-pronged approach. Uh, in the last five years, we've gotten probably, I would say eight awards. Some of them have been for individual projects and some of them have been for the entire program. Um, we take pride in the sustainability of the program and, um, and we're, we're very pleased to do presentations like this so that we, so that we can share it. The sustainable three-pronged approach has three elements. The first is to preserve our pavements. So as we saw on the pavement, uh, the pavement life cycle, you know, we wanna catch the roads while they still can be preserved. That's gonna be the most sustainable treatment we can do. It requires less energy usage, less greenhouse gases, uh, and it extends the life of our good roads, thus not having to do reconstruction or rehabilitation. The second element of our three-pronged approach is using recycled materials. Some of you may have heard of wrap. It's recycled asphalt that gets milled off of old streets. And so we, put a re we mix a rejuvenator in with that and then we reuse that old asphalt and we use this in a lot of our preservation treatments and we repave it as new roads. We also use asphalt rubber hot mix, which, you, which utilizes recycled tires. And thirdly is to reutilize existing in-place materials. This is really one of the most innovative parts of the program. We have these treatments that recycle the asphalt and reuse the asphalt. And so I'll briefly explain a couple of them. The cold in-place recycling is a really impressive operation. It's a long train of equipment, and the, the, the first piece of equipment, it mills off the old road. The second piece of equipment, it grades it into the sizes that it needs to be. The third adds a rejuvenator to it, and then it gets placed behind the train. So if you ever get an opportunity to see this process in action, it's really impressive. You see this big train of equipment moving, and in front of it, you have a deteriorated road, and behind it, you have a brand new street. Now, this is incredibly more efficient than the traditional way of reconstructing a road, where you're excavating all the old material, hauling it all out to a landfill, bringing in on all new material is not a very efficient process. And so, as we'll talk more about, the cold in place recycling treatment is very environmentally friendly compared to the traditional methods. 
The second treatment here is the cold central plant recycling. And this is a similar treatment, but instead of having a train, sometimes you can't get the train all the way through a community. So we'll, we'll remove the asphalt, we'll bring it to a nearby plant, we'll process it, add a rejuvenator to it, bring it back, pave it as new, new road. And thirdly, soil stabilization. So in some cases where the road has deteriorated so far to need a reconstruction, instead of pulling all that material out and bringing all brand new material in, we'll pulverize the in-place materials, add cement to it, and strengthen the subgrade in place, again, uh, removing the need to get all these trucks in and out of the community, and then that provides a sound foundation for the new asphalt surface. What are the benefits of the sustainable approach? We've already talked about a lot of these, um, but cost savings up to 50%, uh, up to 80% reduction in energy usage and greenhouse gas, really, really significant. We've talked about maintaining uh, natural resources, not having to use virgin aggregates in the roads, reducing landfill deposition. We talked about truck traffic, less working days. And actually, you can see on the bottom, that is a picture of the cold in place train actually in action. Here is our, what I would like to consider my favorite slide. It's a compilation of all the projects that we've completed using the sustainable three-pronged approach. A total of 133 projects, which has resulted in a cost savings of $83 million. And all of that money gets plugged right back into the program so we can do more roads and more projects. And with that, I would like to turn it over Back to Mr. Osmena to talk about some of the specific projects here in Altadena. Thank you, Yona. Um, so as Mr. Yona Halpern just noted about, you know, trying to treat the, the, uh, the, the, treat the road at the right, at the right time with the right treatment. Um, yes, we'd, all, all, we'd also like to make sure we, we capture everything up at the certain uh, pavement index to where it's the most economical and more um, I guess sustainable, but of course that not every street is within that level. So, yes, there will be s streets that will be need be constructed. It's already at that point. Yes, there will be uh, streets with certain pavement index to where it needs to be resurfaced. And but then we also have other projects which we've done in the past few years that have implemented the pavement preservation strategy that Yona just pointed out. And this map here is just sort of an overview. Um, of some of the projects we've done over the last three years or so. Um, this top, different type of treatments correlate to different types of, um, uh, or I'm sorry, the different colors signify the different type of treatments that were done for that particular project. Um, that ranged the gamut of some of the, what Yona just talked about, um, pavement preservation, um, a slurry seal, uh, resurface, and even uh, at the very costly end of uh, reconstruction. Okay. With that, um, I'd like to kind of just uh, inform the uh, council and, and the uh, Altadena community about upcoming project, a reconstruction project, with the, which is the most costly type, uh, that's going to be taking place along Washington and Altadena, Altadena Drive. Um, it's a $7.7 .7 million reconstruction project. It's about 1.6 miles of roadway. Um, it will include some parkway improvements, curb ramp upgrades, and a traffic signal modification. Uh, there will be some outreach that will be taking place to the community uh, sometime in the fall of this year. Um, Mr. Uh, Rodrigo Abello is, is going to be the project manager for that particular project. His contact information is there. Um, and like I said, it's scheduled for, for 2023. Uh, if this does, I do want to also point out too, this does have a city of Pasadena par participation, which we're currently working with them on a cooperative agreement for them to pay into this, or pay into this project also. So we're, we're, we've buttoned that process. Um, we're close to getting that agreement uh, finalized. Uh, and then we'll package the project up and, and get it ready for construction at the next uh, paving season of, of 2023. Okay, thanks. And with that, that pretty much concludes our, our presentation. Um, Mr. Steven Gutierrez, he is the uh, resident engineer here for the Altadena uh, era. He couldn't be here today. He was, uh, on, he's a little bit on the weather, but his contact information is there at the top. Um, we also have our general roadway uh, maintenance phone number, which goes directly to our road yard for any 
um, standard uh, roadway maintenance issues you come across, trash, uh, uh, what do you call it, and any general road, road um, maintenance matters, you can call them. And we also have our website here, which has everything, everything public works. Uh, the last number is probably a number everybody should have programmed in their phone. It's, it's our 24-7 uh, dispatch number. Uh, it's a pretty easy number to remember, 800-675-HELP. And you can call that number at any time, time of the day, and if you come across at what, what's considered an emergency, like a traffic signal is out or a, a stop sign is down, et cetera, and, it, and they'll uh, get routed to the, to the appropriate um, maintenance personnel to get taken care of. And with that, we'll, this concludes our presentation on our county's roadway uh, pavement program. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. And Dorothy, you'll put all that information on our website? Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I learned a lot. Oh, okay. Do, we don't have time for questions. Okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna, no, we're going to move on. Okay. All right. What am I doing? Huh? We have another presentation. I know, we have another presentation. Oh, we shouldn't have put the thing up, is what we're saying. Never mind. Oh, we need to stay in our. Okay. We're going to be moving back again. Sorry. Okay. We're going to move right along here to the Foothill Municipal Water Update. Can I just say one, one thing? Okay, we didn't take questions, but if there are questions, maybe you can wait a few minutes and people can come to you directly with their questions. Okay, yeah, back there, that would, yes, thank you, just because of time. Thank you, we appreciate it, I learned a lot. Mm -hmm. I, was just in, I was just informed that um, the streaming live to YouTube is not working, so I don't know. Um, check on that for us. Just FYI, Chris? anyone who's watching can access it through the Altadena Town Council website. So if you go to the AltadenaTownCouncil.org website, you can order, you can access the live stream from there. It says it's working. It says it's working. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. I got this from someone okay. who couldn't access it. Yeah, because we have quite a few people watching too. Okay. So now um, we're going to move on to our special presentations 3.3 Foothill Municipal Water Update. Thank you. That's Nina Jasmedarian. Oh, it's, oh, just Michael Lee. Yeah. I'll just be me. Okay, that's good. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Okay, so I'll move. Great. Um, yeah, uh, my name is Michael. I work for Foothill Municipal Water District, and uh, on behalf of the district and just wanted to say thank you to the Altadena uh, Town Council for having us here today and uh, allowing us to present to the community. Um, so uh, for this presentation, we have two topics that we're gonna cover. The first one is uh, drought conditions and the other one is the emergency, emergency shutdown. Um, Foothill, we've been here in the past um, this year to present you guys with the current drought update. This is just another update on the drought conditions. So before we get started, I just wanna tell you guys a little bit about the district. Uh, so Foothill Municipal Water District were a wholesaler, and we were founded in 1952 when um, our veterans came back from World War II and there was an increase in water demands. So we have, um, so Foothill is a wholesaler, so we do have eight, um, eight retail agencies, eight member agencies that um, purchase water from us. And you can see those eight on the map. And for Altadena, uh, you guys are on the right-hand side. So you can see you're with, uh, you see Lincoln there, you see Rubio, you see Kenaloa. And uh, part, part of uh, Altadena is also uh, serviced by um, uh, Pasadena Water and Power. And if you look on the, on, on the, um, the right-hand side, about 46% of Altadena, Altadena, Altadena's retail agency's water is from local supplies. This is from groundwater, um, from surface water, and the other 54 um, of the water comes from imported, importers and prize, which, which they buy from Foothill Municipal Water District. Um, so groundwater level right now are low. And um, so just to, give you, just to give everybody like a brief overview of um, our water supplies in Southern California, 
As you can see, for importer supplies, we, we get 30% of our water from the state water project, and the other 25 comes from the Colorado River Aqueduct. Um, so that's for importing. And then the other 45% of, uh, of, uh, of our source for supplies comes from local supplies. And as I mentioned before, this can be from uh, groundwater, it can be from desalination, conservation as well. So the, um, it makes up, uh, so all the supplies makes up 100% of, of Southern California's water. And I do want to um, reiterate, um, at least to the community, that uh, water supplies is highly, highly um, reliant on uh, precipitation, uh, on rain. So without rain, there isn't snow, and without snow, there isn't snowpack, and without snowpack, there isn't runoff, and without runoff, we don't get water into our streams, and we don't get water into our streams, we don't get supplies, we don't get, we don't get our supplies. So um, precipitation, rain dictates a lot of our, uh, uh, it dictates, dictates a lot of our supplies. And without, same thing with for local supplies. If we don't have uh, rain, uh, we don't have the water that's, um, that's, um, that goes into our water basins, and without water going to our groundwater basins, our local supplies, and as well as our imported, uh, are in very critical conditions. Next. So as you can see on this chart, this shows the statewide average temperature. As you can see from uh, on, the on the bottom, as you can see for the last, from 1973 to, uh, to 2021, you see that the average, uh, the state, statewide average temperature has uh, increased, increased. And also in the water year from uh, water year 2020 to 2022, it's currently the driest three consecutive years on record. So you look at, um, if you look at the, um, where is this 2020, 21, and 2022, you can see that those are the three years and they're the three consecutive years of, um, of dry years. And as a, re as a result from you know, the dry years that we're getting, uh, not just from California, but climate change and stuff like that, you see that Lake Powell on the bottom right is in, um, you can see where the lines, where, where the water level used to be. I can see the two-tone from where the, where the water line used to be, where the top of the rock is a little bit darker and the bottom of the rock um, is a lot lighter and you can see where the current water level is. And you can also see this um, dramatic difference in Lake Mead and uh, Lake Powell. So Lake Mead and Lake Powell are reservoirs for our Colorado River and you can see from on the um, on the left hand side, this is, uh, that's from 1983, and that's the current condition in um, 2022. And and a lot, not a lot of people know, but uh, in water, water uses the most power. So like for like for electricity, uh, and for the transport to move water from one place to another, that's how we get um, like you know water from these reservoirs to California. It requires a lot of electricity. And a lot of the communities, um, you know, out in Las Vegas, um, communities that rely on these dams to generate power, that's how, they, that's how they generate their power out there. And as you can see from the water level, the, the lower it goes, um, the, the lower it goes and up to a certain point, if the water drops low enough, um, we cannot generate power. And as you know, in California right now, we have, um, you know, safety power shut off. So this is another, this is another like a kind of like a ripple effect from water to energy. And so this is the um, water supply balance for regionally, so in, uh, for metropolitan. So the blue is, uh, is uh, what we're getting um, from the Colorado, uh, Colorado River aqueduct. And that, that's in blue on the bottom. And then um, you see the one in green. So that's from the state water project and exchanges. So as you guys know, most uh, just recently this year, um, we, we only get 5%, uh, a 5% allocation. Currently, we're still at a 5% allocation from um, the state water project. And the state water project makes up 30% uh, of um, our, our importer source. And, um, couple, uh, and just in a couple months ago, the state declared an emergency. So with the 5% allocation, we don't have enough water um, to, provide, um, to pro provide water service to Southern California. That's why about 6 million people in Southern California are in health and safety. 
And that's why, that's why you see it from after the green. Um, if that goes into the pur purple, that's the transfer. And then the one right above that, that's, so that's the demand management. So that's what Metropolitan is looking at when, you know, when you're conserving, um, when you're doing all the demand, ma the demand management, and that's where our saving is. And the one in red is where we have in insufficient funds. And that's where we're trying to close the gap by doing conservation, outreach, and all those other things as well. And this is a map that, um, that shows the areas in the state water project um, that are impacted. Uh, so the areas that you see in the dark, um, the red, so these, these are the regions in Southern California that only get state water projects. So currently, we, have, we only get a 5% allocation. So that's not enough water. And due to the inf infrastructure, um, the pipeline that feeds the water to um, throughout the region, the areas that you see in red are the areas and the communities and the residents that only get state water. So that's why they're on allocation, because due to infrastructure restriction, they only can get um, they only can get state water, and they're, right now they're in health and safety. And this is uh, Foothill's current guidance. Uh, currently, we're at a, we're in um, stage stage four in allocation, and these are some just some of our recommendations. And this this follows uh, into my next topic, which is the emergency uh, the emergency repair for the upper uh, feeder pipeline. So the repair is from uh, September 6th to September 20th. And um, uh, water agencies throughout the region, from retail to wholesalers, are asking uh, our residents to, um, to not, out, to not uh, use water for the outdoor or for 15 days during this repair. And this is a map that shows, um, this, this is a map that shows where the repair is. So as you, if you can see, uh, the CRA, so the CRA is the pipeline that, that is the Colorado River Aqueduct, water that goes, and then you see the arrow that goes up, and it says upper feeder at the Santa Ana River. So that's the area where they're gonna shut it down to do the repair. And as you can see from this map, um, because, because uh, the Colorado River flows through there, and for our service area, for our service area that we are also affected, we, um, we get the Colorado River, but since it's being shut down, um, Metropolitan is only going to give us state water. And as, as I was talking about before, um, the six million people that are currently in health, uh, um, health and safety, were during the shutdown, this period from September 6th to September 20th, um, all the areas um, that were getting Colorado River were going to be getting um, the health and safety water. So that's why uh, Metropolitan, all the other water agencies in our local communities are asking, uh, asking our residents to not water their lawn during the shutdown period, because um, because we do want to help our neighbors, not just you know our neighbors are the you know the the city's next to us or the county, but as a whole you know within the region, uh, as a community within Southern California, we have to try to help each other. It's not a mandatory um, restriction on no outdoor watering, but because of you know the six million people. That are currently being affected, uh, we don't we don't want to use you know um, their water that they're strictly being used for health and safety. And um, these are some just some pictures of uh, where the repair is going to be. So it is it is a big pipeline. Um, the pipeline designed to to flow 750 CFS. Um, I, I think I believe Metropolitan in or and, and you'll see in the next picture where the crack is, but they lowered the the flow to, I believe it's uh, around 500 CFS. And then you can see right there, that's where, that's where it's leaking. And that's where the repair is gonna um, um, take place from September 6th to September 20th. So Metropolitan, they need a two week uh, to repair this. And during this, uh, during this two week, um, like I said before, uh, water agencies in California, retail wholesalers are just asking um, our residents, our customers, just, you know, just for this two a week period um, try to you know not water uh, your lawn so we can help not 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 just ourselves but our neighbors that are in health and safety. And just some more information about um, the shutdown. And um, yeah, so that concludes uh, my presentation. Uh, there there are websites that are available for rebates. Uh, SoCalWaterSmart.com, uh, Foothill Municipal Water District. We also offer our own. Uh, rebate programs. If you have questions, 
on rebates information, um, anything like that, please feel free to give me a call. My contact information is right below. Thank you. Yes. Go ahead. Um, my first question is, is the, thank you. Um, is there any programs going to be in place for gray water insulation for residential homes? It seems extremely wasteful that we use drinkable water in toilets. That's my first question. And my second question is, will there be a moratorium for new constructions for pools in California? So to answer your first question, I'm not, I'm not sure about the second one, but I can answer the first one. So for the gray water program, it is, um, so right now like Pasadena uh, Water and Power, they have a gray water program. And because like permitting with the county is so hard with gray water, um, the only way that you can actually do a gray water program if you do it well through your washer. So you can uh, right now, without just uh, you know, going to the county and applying for a permit to do a bigger size one, you don't need a permit to uh, do a gray water program through your washer. So Foothill Municipal Water District, we're also looking at Pasadena uh, Water and Power, uh, Pasadena Water and Power's uh, program to do a gray water. So it's very similar. We'll provide the incentive, you know, materials. It might be labor too because uh, in the past, when we when we look at other agencies' program and how they approach it, you know, if, um, how much engagement they got, um, a lot, a lot, a lot of the customers. Um, were deter away from the program because of the installation um, process. Mm -hmm. So that's something that we're looking into as well, not just provide the material, but also do um, also provide the a direct install as well. So we're gonna have, uh, that's something that we've been looking into for the last year, and we're probably gonna have a program in place maybe in the next month or two. So if you do wanna visit or just email me in a month or two about the gray water program, uh, we'll have something in place for you. And that's the, it, it has been a common uh, rebate question that I've been getting. So uh, we are interested, and if there is a demand, we would definitely look into it. Um, for the second question, I'm not, uh, I don't have an answer for that. Maybe Nina uh, might have an answer um, for the, you said it was a, for pools? For new construction for pools. New construction to for pools. To put a moratorium on new construction for pools. I mean, that just, after seeing your slides, it's, Seems like such a waste. Yeah, I think uh, for for certain things like that, for like even not just for pools, you know, for new constructions. Um, I don't know. I don't know you guys heard about like you know like accessory dwelling units with the state, because um, we're we're building in California. We have a house, housing shortage, but we don't have a uh, a phasing mechanism, you know, to also account for the additional cost or you know for the additional supply of water. So that's something we need to talk to um, you know legislators and stuff like that to see what makes sense because. Um, we do have a housing shortage. We do want to um, fix that, but we also have to look at the other factors that are involved in that process because we can build all we want, but we don't have the infrastructure and the resources to, um, you know, put those things in place at the, you know, right time. Um, then it, it won't work. So yeah, so it, it is a question, and pull is one of them. So let me, let me. I'm Nina Jasmaderian. I'm uh, Foothills General Manager. Let me answer the question about the pool. We don't have the authority to do that locally. That's something that would be statewide. But there have been studies that have been done that pools actually use less water than lawns mm -hmm. if they're covered. So, um, you know, there's that as well that needs to be worked out because some people are going to, but I, I would cover my pool and I would be using less water. So we need to think about that. But the best thing to do is actually replace turf with uh, drought tolerant plants. That would be the ideal thing for uh, residents to do. And it would help save water. And um, you'd actually, if you go with California native, you'd then be getting the butterflies and wildlife that are native to California that would help the environment significantly. Thank, Thank you. you. Any additional questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, my only comment is if they stop putting in four-story buildings, that would help a lot, too, because where is that water going to come from? But that's another story, another day. Okay, we're going to move on right along here to public safety reports. So can we have the California Highway Patrol, Officer Bay? Okay. 
Good evening, council members, uh, members of the public. I'm Officer Bay with the California Highway Patrol, community-oriented policing service officer. Here to provide uh, some statistics and uh, some awareness for uh, last month and this month. So uh, July of 2022, the California Highway Patrol responded and took 28 traffic collisions. Uh, out of those 28 traffic collisions, uh, eight were hit and runs and seven resulted in injuries with transportation, and only one was uh, investigated for driving under the influence. Um, for this month, back to school. Uh, school is now in session. I am the uh, community officer, so I am kind of responsible for patrolling our, our streets and making sure that uh, parents are, and drivers, motorists, are obeying the rules of the road. Uh, so something that I've always seen when the uh, beginning of the school is, uh, you know, parents that, that would take their children um, across the, the street. So jaywalking is a, is a big concern as well as um, pedestrian crossing uh, vehicles not uh, yielding for pedestrians in the crosswalk. So the California Highway Patrol is going to be looking for those type of violations um, this month and continuing on. Um, so if there's any uh, community complaints, please funnel them through the, our office, uh, number of 626-296-8100. Uh, um, with that being said, we do have a maximum enforcement period for um, Labor Day coming up. So uh, that means that there's going to be more officers on the road, as well as a commercial enforcement day sometime this week. So you'll see a lot of us um, targeting uh, commercial drivers that are either out of lane or speeding on our, on our freeways. Um, with that being said, we do have a radar de uh, trailer deployment on Alta, uh, Alum Alta Drive, so that's going to be helping uh, enforce some uh, speed over there, and we're trying to get another radar trailer on Calaveras Street uh, in between Marengo and I believe Fair Oaks. And uh, I just want to say that the California Air Patrol is hiring, so we're trying to get a thousand new officers, so if anyone is interested in helping uh, your, your freeways and your community, please uh, contact the Highway Patrol. Are there any questions? Questions? I know. My head and my mouth don't <laughs> line up. But, okay. That but concludes thank my you. report. Thank I you. do want to make the comment that I did um, uh, contact uh, Captain Moulton. Okay. Yeah, regarding Edward Bronstein. Okay. Yeah, and we because we've been getting inquiries about what the status of that. Um, cases Understood. and he told us it was still under investigation right so yes. yeah so maybe next month if you could come and bring us some information definitely that yeah, would I, be good yeah i'll have uh, okay. captain moulton um kind of follow up yeah. with our division okay or he see. can come himself that would be good definitely great thank you thank you appreciate you thank you very thank much you. okay moving on to uh altadena sheriff station captain jabari williams I think, is this your first time in front of the mic here in this building? Second. Oh, okay. Second. Okay. Now you made me nervous. <laughs> <laughs> ah, forget it. Um, how's everybody doing? Thanks for having me here. So uh, I'll just start off real fast with uh, quick stats. Uh, crime overall is down, except we're slightly up in our our uh, crimes against persons. Now, I don't know if I talked about it last time but we had uh, an increase in sexual assaults, but they were all, all but one. It was like five of them, but all but one were people meeting up online and uh, one thing led to another. Of course, uh, they're still being investigated and it is uh, one person's word against the other, but every single one that comes in has to be, that's reported has to be investigated. So just be careful about the meeting up online. Um, uh, situations. Uh, recently we had an in increase in vehicle thefts along the hiking trails. Uh, we kind of pinpoint their, you know, people are hiking earlier times because of the heat, so we pinpoint the times between 7 and 1, that's the peak hours that it's happening, so we're trying to do more enforcement around, around that time. Uh, so just be aware uh, it's still a big increase, like 70-something percent uh, increase in vehicle thefts on the hiking trails. Um, national night out, we had our national night out uh, a couple of weeks ago and uh, 
I understand it was very nice. I wasn't there, I was out of town at the time, but people, uh, my staff kept me uh, informed. So we'd like to thank all that came out, thank the town council for supporting us. It was, uh, from what I understand, a very nice event. Our, uh, last week, third Wednesday, we had a catalytic converter etching event. And uh, this was the most successful one we've had since we've been doing them. Uh, we did 105 cars in a five hour period. Um, and I believe our biggest one since then may have been close to 90, but we were gone all day. Uh, we have somebody that's very passionate, Detective Lohman, and uh, he's uh, devised an innovative way using equipment and ramps to where we can speed up the process and it worked out great. So we're trying to put together a bigger program including uh, agencies around the area, Pasadena, uh, Sierra Madre, and uh, any else that wants to be involved, we get a big place, maybe like the Rose Bowl, we're trying to figure something out, and we have a big catalytic converter event. Now we wanna have not just etching, but uh, we have uh, Pasadena, uh, Toyota of Pasadena, who will put cages on, on the, the catalytic converters to keep people from stealing them. So we hope to have them out to maybe they can put that cage on at the same time. Uh, it will be a cost uh, for that. The etching is free. Uh, the cage, I'm not sure what the cost is, about a couple hundred bucks, but we hope to have something big like that. If not, maybe something small at the station. Uh, we're trying to figure that out. Uh, the cage is a better way of securing people from stealing that, that catalytic converter. Oh, you just got one, huh? Yeah. yeah. Uh, long wait? No. Okay. Ordered online. No, just curious. Um, tomorrow, we have a basketball game uh, set up at uh, Sycamores. It's going to be the deputies or the staff at the station against the young kids. So you guys can take bets on who's going to win. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's just one of the little events we want to do to uh, be engaged with the community, so we're looking forward to that. It's going to be tomorrow uh, from 5 to 8, and I guess right afterwards or during that time, we, I think we're going to do a barbecue also. So. Last thing I want to talk about, uh, we have uh, new personnel at the station, uh, particularly uh, supervisors. We have two new sergeants and two new lieutenants. Now, if you guys know uh, Lieutenant Mark Skaggs, he's moved on to uh, Industry Station. Uh, he didn't do it willingly. He didn't want to go, but he was kind of ordered to. It's actually a pretty good move for him, so we're, we're happy for him, and we're going to miss him. But at the same time, uh, we, got, we lost one lieutenant, and they gave me two, so it was a pretty good trade. So... The two that we have in, uh, Lieutenant Dion Batty and uh, Lieutenant Andrea Bradley. I wanted to have them here today, but they couldn't make it. Uh, so next time or sometime soon, I hope to be introducing them to the town council. Uh, you guys may have met them at some of the events we've been having since. Uh, other than that, if there's any questions. Any questions? Oh, Daryl. So knowing that we are opening school and we just had the CHP here. I live across the street from an elementary school and when I have to leave to work and it's about the time that all the parents are dropping them off, I've got a vast majority of parents are double parking in both directions and, and just opening their doors and having the kids run across the street. And that happens completely around the school. Even on Woodbury, they double park. They also will stop in the crosswalk and have the kid just pop out and run, and they or they park blocking the cross uh, the the street. So whose jurisdiction would that be? I mean, I know he spoke, but you're the sheriff's, and and I'm right here at Jackson Elementary, right. and it's a serious problem. E even when I'm driving along at 10 miles, 15 miles an hour, I've got the kids. I'm going to say it's going to be uh, both our responsibility. Okay. However, if uh, you see something and you want it done, you know, you know you, well, if you make a call to the station, we'll certainly come out. You know? Well, it, it would be nice if you could kind of wander through semi yeah. it, once a week or so, maybe once every week and a half. Sure. Because the parents, of a, a great deal of them, once they drop off their kids, they're on their phones, driving, reading 
uh, what's on their phones up above their their steering wheel. And they, I watched a lady near about just kick her kids out of the car and then near about run over two other kids in her seat and uh, while driving her SUV. So I think just having a presence coming through every occasionally would get people to clean up their act. Okay, yeah, I believe this was an issue. It was brought up a while back, and uh, mm -hmm. we put together a little task force, and we'll certainly do that again. Yeah. And we'll get with uh, CHP. They've always been supportive. Especially at the uh, beginning of the year. They have a vast area to cover. Yes. Uh, and we're just right down the street, so maybe, yeah. maybe you know, you call us. We'll, we'll work something out. We'll, yeah, we'll something. I just think it would be nice, semi-regular or off enough that the parents would notice that they'll pay attention. And yes, you sir. can also contact... Um, the principal at the school. I've done that before, and she okay. uh, talks to the parents yeah. about that. So yeah. yeah. Well, okay. I know they do that regularly. It's just all right. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Captain. Captain, one quick question. Oh, isn't there a bar question. is there a barbecue coming up? A tri-tip barbecue oh, yes. coming I'm so up? Oh yes. I'm glad you were. Yes. Um, August twenty seventh, there is a tri-tip barbecue fundraiser at uh, Grocery Outlet Market. I don't have the flyer, it's been a year and since I can't the think of one. the hours, but um, I'll certainly get it out to you. To okay. you. But that is uh, August 27th at Grocery Alley. I mean, we did it um, a few months ago. It was a good success, okay. good food, and so everybody's welcome to, to come. It's a tri-tip sandwich for about 10 bucks a piece. What's, what's the money for? It's for the station support fund, station fund. We, have, we don't have a regular influx of money coming in. So if we want to buy little things like- uh, Petty cash. Yeah, little things around a station, we have to um, raise money for it. Things like uh, etching for the catalytic converters, posters, things of that nature. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you, and if you haven't met Granny, maybe you wanna <laughs> meet Granny. <laughs> Granny, you guys haven't met Granny. Granny's great. Yeah, she's great. Okay, we're going to move on to Marie Grecken, our L.A. County Fire. So good to see you. I know. It's not Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> it is nice to see all the faces. Um, okay, the uh, statistics for the month of July, um, we responded to 329 incidents in Altadena. Um, 272 of those were for medical calls. And of those, we transported 196 patients. Um, we did respond to 10 of the traffic collisions. And we had four fires. Uh, one was a trash fire. Two of them were pole fires, so electrical poles. And then we had one structure fire on Lincoln Avenue, um, an accidental fire in a restaurant. I'm not sure if it was fast food or a restaurant. Um, but it was a bird's nest that was found in the wall um, against the cooking hood of the restaurant. And so that bird's nest caught fire and then hit the structure. I, I'm not sure. Is that on Lincoln? Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. It, it might have been. That's Jim's burgers. Wow. Okay. So that did cost $70,000 worth of damage. Um, and then uh, our safety tip of the month has to do with, uh, since it's so hot outside and everybody's flocking to pools, um, water safety. So just uh, uh, basically, especially our children, although ev anybody can drown in very little water, but especially our children, um, just making sure that you're never taking your eyes off of them when they're in or near any body of water. Don't rely on the barriers, fences, walls, things of that nature. Um, constant, supervi constant supervision is essential. Uh, remove toys from the pool after they're used because then they're just, you know, kids will go out there and try to fish something out of the water. Um, and don't rely on inflatable devices to keep your child afloat. Again, you have to keep watching them. Uh, even if your child has taken swimming lessons, um, you, you just have to watch your children. And it would be a good idea to learn CPR. Uh, for everybody. Uh, and then the last thing I wanted to mention is um, our NOAA weather radios that you are all now aware of, and hopefully the community is aware of this. Um, Dorothy, is the information on the website? Uh, we did a post 
for that, and then if we want to do another one just to continue. It was really focused at that point on the... Uh, yeah, if we if you could capture mm -hmm. just the QR code and the website, um, it's the website takes you, the QR code takes you right to that website. But if you could promote that, um, people can register uh, into... Um, our database to receive what we're issuing uh, to residents in Altadena. We're focusing primarily on those residents, I would say, from a little bit south of Altadena Drive and then all the way north. Um, everybody who is really in a high fire hazard area. We are giving away NOAA weather radios and we now have, we've gone into a partnership with NOAA to be able to issue alerts through those radios um, when there is a wildfire, a devastating wildfire burning in an area that is directly threatening a community and evacuations are either imminent or already in progress. We want to make sure that we have a way of, um, it's just another communication tool in addition to our wireless emergency alerts, uh, you know, the media, all of that, there's, we, we can't, we can't over notify when something is a problem. Uh, so we are, we are giving these, uh, we, uh, the Office of Emergency Management from LA County received a grant and we got these radios and we are giving them out to residents. There's a limit of one per household. Uh, but if you go later to the Altadena website, if you have not already registered to receive a radio, um, there will be the link there. You can register to receive it. It will ask you to put in your email address as well. And then we'll set up another event. We did have one event at the National Night Out uh, where we gave away some radios. We had a couple of other events. Uh, in total, now I can tell you that there are just about 100 households in Altadena who now have radios, who now have these radios. So I still have uh, uh, about 50 people who had registered who have not yet picked up a radio. You're one of them? Yeah, we, didn't make, <laughs> we were out of town for National Night Out. I didn't realize it. Yeah, so yeah. we're going to figure out another distribution event, uh, maybe here. I, I don't know. Um, pardon? During the barbecue, I, well, let me I check my schedule, but uh, that, 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 is a, that is a possibility. Uh, but we'll figure something out, and then as people register, and I capture email addresses, uh, as well as the people who have not yet picked up their radios and any new registrations that come in, I will be able to blast out an email to let you know when you can come and pick up the radio. Um, we are going to continuously be giving these radios out until we run out of them. I don't see us running out of them, so... If you want to one of these radios and you live in a high fire hazard area, I highly recommend that you register to receive one, and then we'll get the we'll get those radios into your hands. Any questions? Thank you. I just want to comment that uh, they were very well received. Yes. So I think uh, yes. just some proactive work there, we can get it out. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I just wanted to say thank you so much yes. that when we had the scare of the vegetation fire, I reached out to you. You got right back to me. I mean, there was like an onslaught of emergency vehicles that rushed up, and then it turned out to be nothing, which is not always the case. Right, right. But I just appreciate your responsiveness so much. So thank you. Oh, thank that's, you. That's why I'm there. So anytime, reach out to me. And I, I don't care what time of day. I'm on 24-7. So. <laughs> thank you, Maria. Okay. Thank you. You've always been helpful. Thank you. You're okay, we're going to move on to our community reports. We have the Altadena Library, Nikki Winslow. All right, I promise to be quick tonight, so I'm not going to be covering as much. I did want to start out by highlighting that we're going to be presenting the design development documents for the Bob Lucas Memorial Library and Literacy Center renovation to the Board of Trustees at their meeting this coming Monday. Um, August 22nd at 5 p.m. This is the first time we're gonna be meeting in person. People can attend virtually as well, so it'll be live streaming on YouTube as well. Um, we will be posting the agenda package sometime tomorrow, which will have all 85 pages of the design documents. So if there's community members that wanna take a look at that, potentially give us public comment. Um, the board will be reviewing, not voting. We're gonna wait to vote until August, or I mean September, so people can have a chance to digest them and provide feedback. 
Uh, other than that, I just wanted to highlight a couple of upcoming events. Uh, we wanted to let everyone know that our Poets Laureate launch, and I have flyers back on the piano for everyone. Um, this coming up next Wednesday, August the 24th. The Poets Laureate have actually existed since 2004 and are sponsored by our friends of the Altadena Libraries. Um, this year's poets are Peter Harris and Carla Samoth. They will be doing some readings as well as several of the past Poets Laureate. There's a list of them on the back. Uh, that's going to be next Wednesday at 5.30 at the main library. I'm also excited to announce that on August 28th, it'll be the 25th anniversary of the main library opening. Um, 55th, what I say? Sorry, 55th anniversary of the library opening actually on that day. Uh, come help us celebrate from 11 to 5 in the main library parking lot. We'll have crafts and games and lots of other things. There uh, will be a special presentation at 12 o'clock and then a performance by Inca, a Peruvian ensemble at 1 p.m. So come help us celebrate. And then lastly, I wanted to make a quick plug for our annual Taste of Dina fundraiser, annual fundraiser put on by the Altadena Library Foundation. Crazy to think that's in like a month from now. Uh, it will be held on Saturday, September 24th, also at the main library. Uh, that will run from 5 to 7.30. You can already visit the foundation website to register for the event or become a sponsor. We will again have an online silent auction. Bidding will start on that actually the week before on September 17th. So hopefully I'll see all of you there. And I kept it short. Thank you, you did. <laughs> okay, we'll have our PowerPoint next, next week, next month. Okay, we're gonna move on to the Chamber of Commerce and we're going to have Doug Cauliflower. Good evening, everybody. Um, Couple things, uh, just briefly, the, the Chamber spearheaded a wonderful event on July 22nd uh, with the dedication to the mural at, on the side of Grocery Outlet. I think everybody was familiar with and, and most I know of the council were certainly there at the event. It was a wonderful event um, to unveil that or officially unveil that uh, mural uh, along with uh, uh, acknowledging uh, Sandra and Jose's first year as the operators of Grocery Outlet. Um, so, if you weren't there, you missed a great time. A um, couple other, there, we have two events coming up in October. We'll have a mixer at Outward Bound Adventures on October 13th from 5 to 7 p.m. And then on October 19th from 8 a.m. till 10 a.m. at the Altadena Town and Country Club, we will be having a State of the State Power Breakfast with Assembly Member Chris Holden in the house. So. And then lastly for the chamber, uh, it is that time of year where we um, look, look at people that are interested in serving the community and perhaps interested in serving as a director on our chamber board. You can reach out to our uh, chamber office, email office at chamber, altadenachamber.org. We can, uh, if you have some questions, we'll get back to you and answer those questions. And if you are interested, we'll shoot you an application. And that's all I have to report, unless anybody has any questions. Okay, okay. now. You want me to just check, do I have to change hats? Yeah, change hats, <laughs> and now okay. you become A cab. I become A cab. <laughs> God, well, that's a wonderful transformation. So, uh, and following the uh, event on the 26th, the A cab uh, uh, sponsored a wonderful open house here in this building. Uh, mainly to commemorate uh, the new exhibit in our lob lobby uh, that has been named Herbert. If, you're, if you haven't seen it, I really encourage you to stop out and, and view it. It's a wonderful exhibit. And secondly, we just wanted to uh, reach out to the community and let them know about this wonderful facility and if they're not familiar with it, to come out and visit. Uh, we had a wonderful turnout, a lot of people. It was very, very successful. And we're really talking about uh, doing a repeat next year and hopefully make it an annual event. So, uh, and then we ACAB had a board meeting uh, last Tuesday, um, just to as the as the building is now opening, just to get back in the routine of meeting. We've been on a hiatus for a couple of years due to COVID, and uh, so just trying to get our feet back on the ground and, and start back in the routine of, of working with the county and, and overseeing this facility and, and making sure things are taken care of the way they should be. 
We also um, elected new officers, and Gene Phillips is our new president. Jamie Bisner is our vice president. And uh, somehow I drew this short straw and will be secretary. Um, and then in closing, I just wanted to acknowledge and thank uh, Veronica Jones for I don't know how many years you served as president of ACAB, but uh, she did uh, a great job. And, and uh, so we thank you for that. Thank so. you. Thank you. And that is all I have for ACAB, unless somebody has a question. Okay. Altadena Community Center Advisory Board. Good question. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to our community reports. And first we have um, Council Member Wong with Safe Streets. Hi, thank you, Chair Jones. So um, I'm just going to give you a quick update on what's happening and some upcoming meetings. Uh, so the Safe Streets Committee uh, meets the last Thursday of each month. So our next meeting will be August 25th at 7 p.m. Uh, you can uh, sign up online on our town council website. Uh, there is a link to the uh, Zoom meeting. Uh, we're working right now. Oh, at that meeting, we're going to have a report from California Walks, uh, who has been helping us learn how to do community walk audits. And those have been um, a really, they are a really great way uh, to get the community to kind of understand uh, their traffic safety issues and concerns and then put it in a, a story mapping uh, program that then can line up with traffic collision data. So uh, we did our first walk around um, from uh, unincorporated coffee up past uh, Avison and Odyssey schools also addressing uh, access and safety around our schools and then up to Loma Alta Park. Uh, so uh, we're gonna get that report back. And again, uh, learning about street story tool um, will also be important. So I urge everybody to kind of get involved. It's, you know, so many people are concerned about uh, traffic safety in our community and uh, it's just a great way to learn and, and understand those tools. And then we're gonna have a special presentation uh, by the National Safe Routes to Schools and Parks Partnership on August 30th at 7 p.m. This will also be a Zoom meeting, and I'll put the link there. And I, in listening to everything, um, you know, streets and all, Safe Routes to Schools is an amazing, and Safe Routes to Parks is an amazing program that does uh, get funding at the federal and state level that can support community safety. Um, and save the date uh, for Walk to School Day October the 5th, um, and join the fun. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that report. Now we have our election report, which is going to be um, very, very important. Yes, Council Member Vega. The passing of our friend and colleague Madeline Barber leaves an empty council seat in Census Track 4611. Starting this evening, we will be taking applications for a special election to fill that seat. Applications can be found on our website and will be accepted until Tuesday, September 5th at 5 p.m. Be sure to designate that you are applying for the special election and confirm that you are a resident of Track 4611. You can find a map of the census track on our website. Track 4611 borders roughly Woodbury North to Mariposa and Fair Oaks over to Lake. Applications will be asked, applicants will be asked to present a two-minute statement at the Tuesday, September 20th Altina Town Council meeting. Immediately following the statements, the sitting council members will take a vote and the new council member will be immediately sworn in that evening. They will serve the remaining 15 months of council member Barber's term. Now, in regard to the regular election, all candidate applications must be returned to the Altina Community Center or the election chair no later than 5 p.m. on October 7th. Um, some other important dates to remember, uh, the candidate's presentation will be at the Altina Town Council meeting on Tuesday, October 18th. The NBBA candidate forum date is still to be determined. Um, voting dates will be November 8th and November 12th and the new member swearing in will be Tuesday, December 20th. 
If you'd like to join the election committee, I'd love to have you. Please either call me or email me. My information is on the Altina Town Council website. Okay, thank you. And there's um, eight seats up for re-election. So okay. there's a lot of uh, uh, room for people to get involved and to become part of this great um, town council. Okay, we're going to move on to our general public comment. And we do have three comment cards. Mm -hmm. Hold on one. Oh, okay, yes. We also have some that were submitted online. So maybe we can do those last and hear the public okay. ones okay. first. How many do we have from online? Uh, maybe six. Oh, we'd have six. Yeah. Okay. okay, all right, we need to move on. Mm -hmm. Okay, is Serena still here? Please come up. And we just ask that you try to keep within two minutes. Okay, yes, great. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Serena Covarubias, and I live on Calaveras Street, and I'm actually the reason why that speed trailer is getting put there. <laughs> I have been working with my neighbors to modify Calaveras Street as a safe pedestrian corridor. Calaveras is a key connector street that links up with multiple schools, landmarks, landmarks, and areas of commerce in our town. Our journey started just before the pandemic with multiple car and pedestrian accidents, driver to neighbor confrontations, as well as pet fatalities. After personally witnessing several of those events, I began the process of mobilizing my fellow neighbors. Our city as a whole has been woefully underfunded. When it comes to things like sidewalks, mixed use lanes for bikes, joggers, horses, as well as the overall safety and easy access for the elderly, children, and the disabled. I'm the disabled, thanks. Um, we wanna change that, but we want to be robustly funded. <laughs> Through discussions and participation with the Town Council's Street Safety Committee, we have been able to participate in multiple programs supported by the California Office of Traffic Safety. Um, uh, Representative Wong uh, actually cited one of those, the Berkeley Safe Street routes. Um, this committee has allowed us to be an active voice in our wants and needs as a street. The county needs to hear and commit to the plans coming out of that community. Um, the city of Altadena belongs to its community and its streets need to be inclusive of all of its people, old, young, disabled, as well as able-bodied. It's not right now. I mean, we've got sidewalks that are not ADA compliant. We've got sidewalks only on one side of the street. It's a big deal. <laughs> and I know that Representative Chu supports the infrastructure bill, but in order to realize the dreams like the one that that bill hopes to achieve, we will not be able to do so without significant changes to our streets and our green spaces. Change cannot come at a more urgent time in history as with what's going on with climate change. And we ask the town council to back and support us on our journey for a safer and healthy Altadena for all of our community. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, our second public comment is from Janet Quigley. Janet, are you still here? Please come up. Dorothy's gonna read it, great. Okay, Dor Dorothy's gonna read it. What? Okay, thanks, okay. So that's You Janet. sent me an uh, email? I did. I've got it. Oh, Nick has it. Yeah, it probably is in the roll. I will maybe move on to another one and I'll find it. Okay, is Dr. Deborah Powell still here? Please come up. Madam Chair, other council members, thank you for the opportunity. I'm Dr. Deborah Powell. I'm the site director for Avison Global Leadership Academy, located on the corner of Lincoln and Altadena. I was appointed to that position in January. And I had the unfortunate experience of having one of our children hit in that intersection. Several of them almost hit in that intersection. And I was talking with our executive director, Mr. Ian McFeed, and we were saying, we have to do something about this. And then in speaking with some of our parents, they were like, this is just not going to work. So we're thinking, okay, let's get together and let's see what we can do. And then I meet Representative Dorothy Wong, who was already 10 steps ahead of us. 
working on the safe streets and routes to the schools and the parks. And I'm thinking, what a wonderful representative. I want to publicly thank you, Ms. Wong, for your dedication and what you do for the safety of our children and our motorists, be it on a bicycle or a car. And I just want to say that the work cannot be done by herself. So I know that you all are with her for us. And I don't know how often you're told thank you, but I just stepped forward tonight to say thank you for all that you do to help keep us safe. And we just appreciate what you are doing here in our community. Thank you all so very much. Oh, wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, we don't hear it often. We hear mostly complaints. <laughs> but thank you. Thank you. Yes, that made my night. Thank you. Okay. Dorothy, if it's all right, I'll go ahead with this. This is from Janet. Uh, to my fellow residents on my property, I have a very large Italian stone pine situated on the south side. It provides shade for over 40% of my property in the summer months. For years, I have struggled to work with SCE to follow their own stated best practices and only trim this tree during the winter, which is appropriate for all conifers. They send me regular notices or send people to my gate throughout the year asking to trim the tree at inappropriate times. For the health of the tree already struggling under the stressful conditions of record-breaking heat waves and drought, I insist that they schedule their work in the winter. Every fall I call them numerous times to get on their schedule for November, December, January, or February. My calls are not returned, even those left for individuals leaving notices at my gate. After ignoring my request, SCE has now notified me by registered mail that they will be trimming the tree this coming Friday when 98 degrees is forecast. With fresh asphalt applied to the street, some days ago the ambient temperature will easily exceed 105 degrees. I'm hoping other community members will join me in familiarizing themselves with the appropriate protocols for various species of trees on their property that affect power lines. The short version is that conifers, evergreens should be only trimmed in the winter and oaks should only be trimmed in the summer. Most other species will easily tolerate fall pruning. Spring pruning, as common as it is, should be avoided generally. I hope Altadino will hold SCE accountable for the commitment they made to us in this very room a few years back. At that meeting, they committed to respect our important canopy and to adhere to their own guidelines for the benefit of our environment. It was a hollow promise. Thank you. Thank you, and I have a name of a person we can send that directly to. So we will, so we will get on that first thing in the morning. And Billy is already. Oh, Billy. I already that to uh, Mr. Ford. There's and another Mr. person. Mr. Ford also responded to it as well, but okay. I, I just received that response just before the meeting. Okay. And it, and it also, there was an email to them, several people at SCE. So I, I guess I should make sure that you know who that is because okay. I'm letting them. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll be out right we'll on it. Up. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you. And I learned something new. I don't need to trim trim my oak in the winter, just only in the summer. Absolutely. Okay. Perfect. There are okay. no more comments on your side? Is it me now? That's you. Okay. Let's roll. Uh, so our public comments. Uh, dear council members and the Altadena community, California Clean Air Day is coming up the 5th of October. There's a couple of things that you can do to get ready for Altadena's Clean Air Week, October 3rd through 8th. What is Clean Air Day? When it comes to air pollution, we can all do our part. Whether you're an individual, business, government agency, or nonprofit, there are things we all can do to improve air quality and protect public health. In the state, with some of the worst air pollution in the US, it is imperative that we do that. California Clean Air Day is built on the idea that the shared experiences unite people into action to improve our community health. Uh, by joining together on a unified week, <laughs> or day, action we take can create habits to clear the air for all members of California's diverse and Altadena's diverse communities. Um, so there are a few things you can do. First, check the California Clean Air Day pledge at cleanairday.org, uh, individual pledge. I'll put the link on the website um, or share it around. And then second, uh, mark your calendar for Clean Air Week, October 3rd through the 8th, 3rd Watch the posts on Facebook and next door starting next month for ways you can participate. Looking forward to seeing you in October 
for Altadena Clean Air Week, and that's from Joy Walters of uh, uh, Cha Cha. Uh, the next comment is from a Re Meadows resident. I have been a Meadows resident since 1970 and have always understood that I lived under the domain of our local wildlife. In those 50 years, I have never witnessed such a heightened presence and activity of our bears, nor would I ever imagine that a bear would enter my home, yet ripping my kitchen window screen and demolishing my entire kitchen. Because of that incident, a bear charging a neighbor and a bear swatting and injuring a neighbor, California Fish and Wildlife for days had a bear trap in our neighborhood and thankfully without success. We know what the end result would have been if the bear had been trapped. Something needs to be done to prevent the bears that, uh, from feeling at ease to make our neighborhood their vacation homes. It begins with all of us in the Altadena Foothill uh, residents bordering Pasadena trails, receiving education on living with our wildlife. The other major issue is that bears continuously access our trash bins that are not bear proof or resistant due, the con due, due to constant red tape of receiving them from our sanitation companies. It shouldn't be the equivalent of finding that hope diamond to be able to acquire a bear proof resistant can if you live in the area that has bears. There should also be some sort of ordinance that residents cannot leave trash bins curbside for the entire week and people passing by tossing fast food containers uh, in them. We cannot progress our love of wildlife if we are not exhausting all efforts and resources to protect them. Uh, the next uh, public comment is from Michiko Lynch. Dear Altadena Town Council members, my name is Michiko Lynch, living at 3589 Canyon Crest Road. Our Lower Canyon Crest neighborhood in the Meadows is having bear issues. In other words, human issues. I urge all Altadena residents who are living close to wildlife to start taking actions to reduce bear conflicts while we also uh, can start thinking of sustainable solutions such as community composting. The best way to avoid attracting bears is to take food scraps to local drop-off stations. That's from California Fish and Wildlife's recommendations. Thank you for thinking of the well-being of the bear while taking on climate action, coexisting through composting. Uh, the next comment is from Janet Castro. Uh, on my property, oh, we did that one. Thank you, Janet. Uh, rolling along, uh, Sarah Wolf. Uh, my name is Sarah Wolf, and I've been a resident of Altadena since January 2022 after relocating here from Washington, D.C. with my family. I would like to provide comments regarding street safety around Loma Alta Park. Uh, we are frequent visitors to Loma Alta Park and Playground. As a family concerned about air pollution and CO2 emissions, we prefer to walk or bike to the park, which is only a few blocks from our house. Unfortunately, we must choose walking along Loma Alta Drive, which has no sidewalks or bike lanes, with cars frequently driving above the speed limit, uh, when cycling or walking with my children, ages five and eight. It's a harrowing experience. The other option is to walk along Palm Street and access the playground through the lower park. While there are no sidewalks along Palm Street, there is little traffic, so I feel a bit more confident that we can make it to the park safely. I appreciate the crosswalk at Loma Alta Drive and Sunset Ridge that makes the pedestrians more visible to cars. However, there are challenging issues when crossing with a bike or a scooter the horse gate blocks the crosswalk, and there's no curb from the sidewalk to the crosswalk, forcing the cross, uh, crossing the cross right in front of the crosswalk, if that made sense, in the middle of the street, then bike back to the crosswalk. There's also an accessibility problem for people using wheelchairs, scooters, or even strollers. Uh, there's, I'll finish the sentence. There's no way to connect them from the sidewalk to the crosswalk. So the last sentence is, um, um, uh, asking the county for some help with that and then presenting opportunities and um, Sarah wants to get involved in uh, microclimate and wilderness interface uh, and would uh, propose the idea of starting a sustainability committee. Uh, so that's her points there. And uh, Deepa Joseph is the next comment. Uh, she, she is a distraught resident. I'm writing to report the incident from yesterday August 15th in Altadena, a black Audi SUV 
uh, sped through the intersection of New York Drive and Mithlodian Drive, veering onto an offshoot of New York Drive where there are houses on the right-hand side. The driver were dangerously crossed over, not checking for vehicles approaching the intersection. It would have been a fatal accident if my car had reached the intersection a second too early. Uh, the driver proceeded, proceeded to their house, uh, completely oblivious to what he or she had done. New York Drive is becoming a dangerous street with rash drivers. I lived in the neighborhood for a decade and now frequently witness the behavior while on, uh, while on a walk or a drive. Maybe there is a way to put stop signs in along New York Drive, definitely intersection at Mithlodian. Please uh, uh, bring this matter to the appropriate. Uh, I think this is our last comment. Um, Tina, sorry. Um, Tiprin Mandalay Follette. I've been horseback riding on the trails and streets in Altadena, Pasadena, La Cunada for the past 15 years. My husband is a mountain biker and my children have ridden both horses and bikes. Uh, on these trails. We've seen an explosion of the popularity of trail use by both bicyclists and hikers over the years, leading to a major safety concern uh, for myself as an equestrian. The impact of the population growth on the trails has drastically decreased the use of equestrian, equestrian trail use due to the fact that the county um, is not keeping up with the trails uh, to be safe for our use. Horses are more than the heritage and the history of our community. They are, perfect, they are a perfect indicator for whether or not safety measures are working for all people. Um, and I'll just move to the end here. Uh, she's asking if we could put the trail back together and connect the Altadena Crest Trail. We have some amazing trails. Loma Alta Drive uh, has a dangerous situation for horses and cyclists and pedestrians and who just want to walk to the next block. Uh, this is uh, really true for crossing the road at Loma Alta. We've got numerous street crossings to get from the trail uh, to the no trail and no crosswalk. That means we've got to stick our horse out into the two-way traffic and run. Um, I know we're running out of time, so I'm going to roll to her end here and then send the comments. Um, even with mythical trail courtesy, the momentum and speed and height of uh, bikes, she's concerned about bikes, uh, cannot be stopped in time to prevent accidents. We don't have room in the single track trails to get uh, away from them. It's so dangerous. I really don't understand uh, how this continues to happen. My dream is for the city and the county to build a bike park uh, for these people uh, to have uh, jumps and ramps and speedy areas that they need, just like skateboards need and motocross, so they can stay off the public trails. I think it would be a huge benefit for a small business. Um, thank you for listening to my comments. If I can be of service to the community in any way, my horse and I are available. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tiprin. That's it. Okay, thank you for our public comment. Um, and you can forward those so we can get them to the appropriate people. Okay, thank you, and thank you to everybody here. Um, I think we've covered everything, and now I just need a motion. All those in favor, don't say it too loud. <laughs> All those opposed, thank you. Thank you. It is 9 o'clock. Okay, can I ask for help?